Morning. Today is May the 3rd. That's what I'm recording this for, Sunday, May the 3rd. And that means tomorrow is May the 4th. Uh, in addition to being the uh, annual celebration of all things Star Wars, may the 4th be with you, uh, it is also the day on which the uh, stay-at-home order for the state of Missouri is going to run out. And uh, thus, the governor has made it clear that this is the day where uh, the businesses and organizations of Missouri can begin to figure out how they're going to function in this, uh, this time to come in which we still need to maintain socially distant practices but can begin to gather in somewhat larger groups. And so, uh, we are going to be having a board meeting this Wednesday, and we are going to discuss how to gather in the future as a church. I don't know what will be our first Sunday returning. We need to work that out. And it boils down to how annoyed are we willing to be with uh, the precautions that we have to take, masks, distancing, uh, etc. It's... Um, so I, I do ask for your, pace, your patience and your grace as we work through this. Uh, we are doing this uh, so that we can balance our need to be together with the safety of those we love. Uh, the word of God, uh, the reading this day, comes to us uh, brought to, by uh, Brenda. And so thank you, Brenda, and let us listen right now. Acts 3, 1 through 11. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And they took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Portico, utterly astonished. As you can tell, now I have a dog with me. Sunny wanted to have some attention paid to her, and she's chilling with me so that she doesn't wake up the children this morning. So uh, we're going to preach a sermon with a dog, it looks like. You going to be okay with this, Sonny? As we read the book of Acts, it is, as the name implies, a book focused on the acts, what the, the actions of the disciples in the days following the resurrection. And so... Uh, what we see is this story in, in Peter, uh, focusing on Peter, about how he comes across a man who is lame, and uh, he offers to heal him, and that's what he does. Peter heals someone, saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And that's what the man did. And this obviously draws attention, and it leads us to ask questions about ourselves and, and miracles. And wouldn't it be nice if we could do miracles today? I think it would be rather convenient, especially at this particular time. And so we're going to ask, uh, this is the next in our set of questions about uh, post-Easter. Like, e as Easter people, we've asked about how do we offer second chances as, as Easter people. Uh, and, and last week we talked about 
the way that uh, resurrection changes the person who is resurrected. We, we only have an example of one, of Jesus, but uh, what is that? what can we see about that for ourselves? And, and today we're going to be looking at this other thing that happens after Easter. We are looking at the way that uh, Peter is able to do this, this miracle, and why, why don't we see that anymore? Now, if we're going to start pondering miracles, uh, I, there are people kicking around lines of thought like, you know what, they, the miracles served their purpose in the first century to, to help the founding of the church and they're no longer needed, and maybe that's why. It could be that there was something essential about the way that the disciples were trained by Jesus that, that we have lost, and maybe that's why. I, I don't know. What I do know is that if I want to start figuring out something, I'm going to start with Scripture. And so that's where I want to start today. I want to start by, let's, let's go back into the Old Testament and see the, the miracles of, of the Old Testament and see where, where they go and where they land with us in the miracles of the New Testament. So if we go back into the Old Testament, what we see is, is that God is doing these big events, these big moments that, that are changing the course of history. And that, that really is the, the major difference in scope between the Old Testament and the New. In the Old Testament, there are the, these massive moments that change the course of entire peoples, of entire nations. And so we see things like the Tower of Babel, where all of the nation's languages are, are scattered, and that helps understand that we are fragmented today due to God's response to arrogance then. Like, so we have a moment like that. We have uh, the ten plagues where uh, God calls the Hebrew people out of Egypt, and they are uh, called out of Egypt and taken through the Sea of Reeds and then given manna to, to maintain and sustain them. And so these are the moments when God is acting directly, uh, leading them with a, a pillar of fire and a pillar of clouds by night and by day. There are the miracles that we see where a lot, something like Elijah faces off against the 400 prophets of Baal and the 450 prophets of Asherah. And they try to call down fire upon their burnt offering and cannot. And then uh, Elijah can upon the burnt offering he's offering to God. So again, it's in the context of an entire nation that this is happening. And so for the most part, we have these very large scale moments. There are some smaller things that uh, happen. The moment where uh, Elisha uh, retrieves a lost axe head by asking it to float. Or when Elijah uh, spends the time of a famine living with a woman who uh, never runs out of flour. Like, so we have moments like that. But in broadly speaking, the Old Testament has a very broad focus. And then we turn to the New Testament, and we see all the scope really comes down and, and narrows down. And we see the way in which it's about Jesus and what Jesus is doing in individual people's lives. And it's a very more, far more focused uh, uh, narrative here. And I think we, the best place to look as we're trying to work through how to think about miracles is actually the, the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, it is the last of the Gospels that is written. And in the last of the Gospels that is written, it shows this because it has uh, the author, John, has taken plenty of time, has had plenty of time to work through how does he understand what the miracles did? How did they function? What, why were they done? And, and he talks about the same miracles that the other uh, Gospel authors wrote, wrote about. So he's not telling us anything new in that sense, but what he does does do is he gives us a new word for them. He doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. He calls them signs. And that is worth pausing to think about. Because a sign is something that points. It points a, a, a directional sign, like how many miles is there to go to Chicago or whatever. Like that's the type of sense of sign that this is. The signs point to something. And so these signs, what they're pointing to is where Jesus is going, what Jesus is, is focused on, right? Whenever Jesus is, is preaching, the, the best summation of Jesus is preaching is repent for the kingdom of God has come near, right? And so these are the signs of the kingdom. These are the signs of what it looks like when Jesus is king 
in the, in the fullness of all that that means. That the kingdom has come near, and if you want an example of what it means, what it looks like, let me give you a sign, a, a clip, a, a moment of what that kingdom is like. Let me show you something. And then gives one of these uh, signs. And how many does John point out? Well, John points out seven signs. Right? In, in John 20, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs, which are, which are not written here, but these signs are given so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that in believing in him, you may have life. And so these are the seven signs that John gives. The seven being the, sign, the, the number of completion. Here's like a complete set. Here's what you need to know about the, 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 all the indicators you need, all the signs you need that point towards the kingdom that Jesus is bringing about. And so we have the seven signs of John. The water to wine at the wedding in Cana. The healing of the official's son. The healing of a paralyzed man. The feeding of the 5,000. The water walking on water, the healing of the blind person, and the raising of Lazarus. This set of seven signs come together and prepare us to then see the greatest miracle, the resurrection. All right, this is the, the resurrection that, that, that is the sign of the kingdom that is, is to come, that there is real power here that is going to change everything, that even death has been conquered. And that on the other side of death, what is it going to look like in the kingdom that is to come? Well, look at the signs. The signs tell us that there's going to be joy. <laughs> Creating that much wine for a wedding, that does create real joy, right? There's going to be feasting, the feeding of the, the, fe the, the 5,000. There's going to be uh, health, all the people who are healed. And this is all predicated and based upon the raising from the, the dead of La Lazarus. This is the sign that then points towards the, the, the resurrection, which is the, the greatest of them. C.S. Lewis, a British author when writing about these miracles, describes them as an event when God makes happen what nature is already going to make happen, but just does it a bit faster, a lot faster. And if we think about that, look at the signs that Jesus does. Like, I can take water and I can make wine, I just need time to, to water the grapes and then crush the grapes, then ferment the grapes, right? It, it, it's going mean, it's, it's to take me a lot more time. If we look at the healing, yes, over time people can be healed. I can't do it that fast. If we look at the feeding of the 5,000, we can feed 5,000 people. It, it would take us a while. And so that, that's how C.S. Lewis thinks through this. And when coming to the resurrection, th it's, this is still true. It is that we can all be resurrected and following Jesus. The miracle for Jesus, the sign is that Jesus has already done it because he's, he's ahead of us. He's doing it faster than us. And as we follow him, when we come to death, on the other side of death, we will do what Jesus has already done. And so as people who live in the light of the resurrection of Jesus, the greatest of miracles, what do we think of miracles today? Like, I wish there was a simple answer I could give you. I wish I had it all figured out. Right? Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah at one point, talking about how some people do not understand the parables. For if they had ears to hear and eyes to see, that they would then understand. And it might be that this is the case today, that there are miracles happening for those with eyes to see and ears to hear, and there are miracles happening all the time. It's just a matter of knowing them and, and seeing them. And it could be that miracles are happening, signs of the kingdom on, on a small level and people being healed. It, it could be things happening on a bigger level. It's just a matter of being able to see um, what, uh, what, what is out there. Right? Another slant on this is another approach could be to say that everything, if we're going to follow with the Gospel of John and say that miracles are the signs that point, like we could say that everything that needs to be pointed to has already been pointed to. The signs are there. There's this moment in Luke 16 in which the, the, uh, Jesus tells this, this parable, this story of a, a, a rich man who steps over Lazarus day after day, ignoring Lazarus. This is a different Lazarus than the Lazarus that, that is raised from the dead in John. 
but uh, how a rich man steps over Lazarus day after day after day, and, and then they both die, and Lazarus goes to the kingdom of, to, of God, and the rich man goes to eternal torment, and, and that the rich man says, may I go back and tell my brothers? And Jesus' response is, your brothers have everything they needed they had everything they needed to be able to, to make the right decision. You, you going back and telling them would not add anything. And maybe that's where we're at with miracles. Maybe there is, there is everything known that needs to be known, and adding more to it would not change how people respond. Maybe that's how we think about it. If someone asks me personally, just on the street, like, what do you think about miracles, Andy? How, how do you make sense of it? This is what I would say. This is the best I have. I would say that I see the goodness of God all around me. I see the beauty of music. I experience the grace of friends that forgive. I experience the faithfulness of family, the joy of a child's laughter, the healing of people who are broken, and I see people reconciling who were once parted. I see these things, and they are good, and they reflect God's goodness. And you can call them miracles or not. But what matters more to me is that I invite you to see them with me and to know that they are signs that point to the goodness of God. They help me know who God is. And in and, and seeing them, I am drawn to them. And in being drawn to them, they help me follow Jesus towards his kingdom, which is to come. That is my hope. I don't fully understand why we do or do not have miracles today, but what I do understand is I do see the goodness of God in, my, in the life around me, and that points me towards the kingdom, and I hope that others will join me in walking towards that kingdom. Amen. You have been chill this entire time. Good job. I did not expect that to work. I just knew that having a dog running around the sanctuary barking at me intermittently also wasn't going to work. Let us pray. Lord, we live as your people pointed towards your kingdom, a kingdom that we learn about not just through what you have taught, by, but also by what you have done, giving us signs of healing, of feasting, of people being made whole. Help us to hold on to those signs ever more closely now that we might be sustained in these days when life is challenging. We pray for the eyes to see and the ears to hear what you are doing in this world and to know it is good. We pray for those who are having to make decisions in the coming days, decisions that will matter. And for those who need to decide to wait and pause to, continue to stay apart from others, we pray for their patience. For those who have to decide to go and be more involved, we pray for their safety. We pray for all those who are working towards cures and treatments. We pray for all these things in the name of you, our, Son, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, I hope you continue to do well. I look forward to seeing you soon. May the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.